All right, so this time it's getting into uh, Kiersey stuff and Kiersey's temperaments or the KTS, Kiersey Temperament Sorter. This is another very important and very popular in a certain kind of way um, typology system that is integral to MBTI. A lot of people who deal with MBTI or MBTI stuff don't even realize how much of Kiersey's work and contributions are really all over MBTI. It just kind of got absorbed into MBTI without always giving it a lot of credit where it came from. So this is a little bit um, of just an overview with Kiersey um, and getting into more of my thoughts on it and how this kind of relates to socionics, MBTI, typology in general, some of the pros and cons and all that kind of stuff. For some of you, this might be <clears throat> old hat, stuff you've seen before, you're very familiar with Kiersey, so it's no big deal. Others, you may have never heard of him, which is part of the reason why I want to talk about this stuff, because I feel like people should know of him. So why should you know about him? Why, what's the point of this? As I said, Kiersey came up around, uh, well, he was very integral to MBTI, as I mentioned earlier. A lot of his profiles, his descriptions, uh, the way he sorted things out got absorbed into MBTI. Now, he has a certain way of doing things that has certain advantages and disadvantages, okay? Some of the pros. Pros of the Kiersey system is that he is sort of integrating it with the concept of temperament. Temperaments is a very old idea for personality typing that's been around really since at least the ancient Greek. This concept of sorting people into four basic temperaments. In some cases, we've heard of this talked about in elements where you say some people are very air-like, some people are very fire-like, very uh, earth-like, water-like, whatever. That was Plato's way of breaking things down. Eventually you get to Galen in the Roman era and Galen discusses this in terms of the humors and he starts talking about sanguines and cholerics and uh what is it, phlegmatics and melancholics and so on this same concept keeps going and going and going until it reaches the 20th century and then you have some people like van der Hoot, another dutch psychologist who also picks up on temperaments and he writes his mbti comes around in the what 1940s or so and eventually you get Kiersey. Now, this is an advantage here that the use of temperaments is a very simple system that it's generally fairly easy to observe in people. And it is um, kind of based more on empiric observation of people. Right. So instead of coming up with a theoretical model where you're very nice and neatly, almost in a very mathematic writing on a chalkboard kind of way, which is what you see with socionics and MBTI trying to break down these little functions, that stuff can be very difficult to see sometimes, very difficult to put everything in order, figure out exactly someone's cognitive stack and so on. You can't even prove whether the things even exist or not, right? But you can kind of easily demonstrate, or a lot more easily, I should say, someone's temperament, whether they're very uh, impulsive and hot-headed and, and want to get things done now, um, whether they're more calm and relaxed and they like to work with people and uh, be very empathetic towards people or whether they're kind of a very nerdy, all brains kind. Those things are a lot easier to observe. We've all seen that since we were kids. You can see it in small children, long before children even have the ability to really think, okay, and put words. Okay, they are already behaving naturally according to a certain temperament. So one of the pros, trying to point out here again is kind of the easy observation of people that it's based more on that empirical observation and so that's just helpful it's a lot easier to do that <clears throat> this is also a lot easier to learn 
it's a lot easier to understand, to grasp it, and begin working with it, begin using it in, in different applied ways. I also think Kiersey does one thing that a lot of the other systems don't, which is that he quickly starts talking about the utility of things. Why is this important? How can you use it? How would you relate to other types? What jobs would fit you best? How your parenting styles would come into play? Uh, relationship style, all of that stuff, which is very utility-based. Here's he kept that front and center, this concept of utility. What is the cash value is what he used to say. In other words, he was trying to very PE like figure out what gives you the most bang for your buck. At what point do you get diminishing returns because you're spending so much time having to study and understand a typing system before ever really being able to apply? And then how many people are willing to spend that much time trying to learn a psychology system that may or may not even be um, approved of by the wider mass, right, by the general psychology community, stuff like that. And then what is the general interest of most people? People who don't work in psychology anyway. Why would they want to spend so much time trying to learn a typing system that could take you years? So he was very pragmatic in that way. I think that is an excellent approach. I think it's one of the things that gets left out in many of the other systems. Now, when you contrast this or compare and contrast this to Socionics, for example, Socionics has a lot more detail, can really explain a lot of things in detail. Details such as which functions are at work here, which elements are going on in what order, why your particular cognitive stack does not work well with somebody else's stack. Um, socionics can be a little more accurate and descriptive as to your unique motivations uh, and a way of approaching things that's more specific to the individual type. So there's just a lot more, as uh, Jack would say, explanatory power in socionics. In terms of at least getting to these details of the, the functions, the stacks, and so on, you can, you can get a lot out of that with socionics. However, socionics, because it is so complicated, because it is so formulaic, so much like this mathy algorithm, it is very difficult for many people to understand it. People spend a lot of time just trying to grasp the, the structure, the functions, the, uh, the, uh, um, the order of things, the definitions of things, why it goes this way and that. And they don't really move on, or it takes them forever to finally move on to understanding other types, understanding the intertype relations, and then going on to the practical stuff of how can this help you in your relationships, in your work life, in your, um, uh, you know, just other practical things. It's like, it is there in socionic, but it's almost buried in the back somewhere because everyone spends so much time just trying to figure out definitions. So when it comes to getting the most, the cash value, getting the most bang for your buck, socionics can really be a pain in the ass. It is by far and away socionics' biggest flaw, um, as well as it's not very accessible. It's very difficult to get good information from socionics. So that's bad. All right. So those are some pros and cons. Uh, this system, Kiersey system, and Socionics have some things in common. There is some overlap. They do have elements of the old Carl Jungian um, thinking going on, but they're, they're not exactly one for one. They don't really overlap quite right. Some definitions aren't the same. Certain things aren't right. Okay, So there will be challenges if you're trying to overlap that many people like to do that. I understand why they would. 
kind of a natural instinct to do that. All my INTPs seem to absolutely adore trying to make all these systems overlap. My hat's off to them. All right, enough yammering on that. Quickly, Kiersey, who is he? What is he? He is human. Kiersey is a, a, a psychologist, an American psychologist. He originally kind of started off, uh, he became a fighter pilot in World War II. After World War II, went out, became a psychologist, um, got interested in temperaments, and then eventually found interest in the MBTI. And he started sort of combining the two ideas, focusing more on temperament, believing that temperaments was the most important piece and that the MBTI, like 16 personalities, just kind of falls within that. Okay. So this is uh, happening back in about the 60s and 70s. Kiersey did actually talk to uh, Myers Briggs and the family of Myers Briggs that obviously created the MBTI. So he had contact with them. He had contact with the, the whole organization of Myers Briggs, and he was involved in that. He ends up creating profiles for each type, each of the 16 types. He based it a lot around people that he knew. Again, he was doing this very empirically based on observation of people around him and created these sort of profiles, which eventually kind of gets absorbed into MBTI as some of the some of the profile description for different types. Okay. This was happening, as I said, about the 60s and 70s. Eventually, he comes around to, I believe, around the 90s or in the 80s, I should say, 70s and 80s. He comes out with one of his first books on this, on Please Understand Me. Came out, got some decent review, but it wasn't quite so great. He eventually comes out with Please Understand Me Too, I think around the 90s, more or less. Please Understand Me Too is his big, the main source, the main book that most people go off of. And eventually, in the late 90s and the 2000s and so on, he kind of adds several more books. Then he finally comes up with Personology, which is a very difficult read by comparison to Please Understand Me Too. Now, key, key things about Kiersey, uh, important stuff in what his system was doing. He started with temperament, he incorporated the 16 personalities, and he um, spent a lot of time, decades, going through all this stuff, writing this out and debating and arguing the Carl Jungian um, cognitive functions and the definitions and how that should work and play into it all, right? discussing what is NI, what is FE, what is basically the same stuff that all the rest of us are doing in typology right now, right? How many times are you spending trying to figure out what is NI, what is TE, what is TI, arguing with other people on what it actually is versus what it's not? We all suffer these headaches. So in Kiersey's view, eventually he started to drift further and further away from the cognitive functions. He started to see it as, as not being that important and being somewhat unreliable and not a good way of looking at things anyway. So he just drifts further and further away from it. Um, now, when it comes to his temperament disorder, one of the areas where it does tend to run into problems is when you're trying to align his types with the 16 personality there are glitches and part of the glitches is because the way he was he decided to kind of like split things up just doesn't really fall in line very well with our understanding of cognitive functions and the definitions of those functions especially if you are coming out of socionics si for example and se are not they're defined a bit differently in socionics than how they were with the MBTI and how Kiersey was kind of looking. Okay, so his types are all described differently. So how should you use Kiersey? I think you should try very hard, look at his temperament, look at the profiles and descriptions, and try to ignore 
the individual type name. So when you're looking at something that says ESTP, try your damn hardest to ignore that it's saying ESTP. Just read the profile for what it is and take the name of whatever something. If it says champion, whatever, the champion. Try to avoid looking at ENFP and ISTP and whether ISTJ and ISTP line because you're going to drive yourself crazy. Stop it. It, it just is pointless. Just stop it. Just read the type description. This is what it is. That's what it is. Fuck it. It's a champion. It's, it, you know, that's it. You'll just, it'll just help you out. All right. All right. That's enough background breakdown. Let's get into this. All right. So here's this page, the four temperaments, here's c.com, temperament overview, blah, blah, blah. Okay. This is the online component, which is meant to be more of like a supplement to his book. He does have a test on here um, that you can take and see what you get. I'll leave it at that. For now, okay, the four temperaments, he called them, okay, artisan, guardian, idealist, and rational. These, generally speaking, line up with the classic temperament overview of uh, your sanguines, your phlegmatics, your uh, cholerics, and your what was it, melancholic. Generally speaking, and you could look at it as you as you cut through this. All right, so here the overview: temperaments configuration of observable personality traits such as habits of communications, patterns of actions, and sets of characteristic attitudes, values, and talents. So some people would say that Kiersey is very much a behaviorist because he's looking at traits and things that people are doing a lot of. This is debated. A lot of people argue that back and forth. If you know, one thing he's definitely focused a lot more on is this empirical view based on observation, on things that you can actually see someone doing. He focuses heavily on that in order to come up with this thing, this uh, temperament sort. Now, I mentioned before, what are the pros of that? It's a lot easier to see what someone talks about, how they talk, what they go after, how they behave. It's a lot easier to see that and demonstrate that to other people. So when you look at someone and say, this person is doing this, they're behaving like that, other people can see it because it's observable. External behavior somebody's doing that they seem to show interest in. That's much, much easier to work with then trying to debate and argue whether somebody is processing NI or SI or any of this crap in their head. We can argue about what is being processed all day long and get no. Right. That's just pros and cons of it. All right. So keep going. Um, here's how his stuff breaks down. This is why his is rather convenient. Okay. He focuses on communication. A communication and action. He basically said that uh, what's important is what do people talk about and then what do people do? What are the things that they seem to show a lot of interest? They're talking about it a lot um, and the way in which they talk about it, the way in which they communicate. Okay. Very stuff that we can easily see and observe. And then what do they actually do? Instead of just what do they say they'd like to do or what things have crossed their mind, what do they actually do? What are the things they actually seem to want to go after and deal with? Right? Makes a lot of sense. So in this temperament matrix that you see over here, he basically broke down to communication styles. Are people talking in a concrete way or are they talking in an abstract way? We tend to do, we, yeah, we do notice this a lot. Some people talk about concrete things. Concrete being reality. This is what it is. This is how it is. Talking about the object directly for what it is and how things actually work. Talking about day-to-day -day stuff that are actually going on that we're all aware of. This is how you have to do it. Okay, versus abstract things. People talking about ideas, dreams, fantasies, um, People talking in metaphors all the time. That's one we do notice from time to time. There are some people we encounter that seem to always be talking in metaphors and analogies and, and uh, 
uh, figurative language all the time, and they seem to really struggle to ever put something in specific concrete terms. Say, this is what I'm talking about. This is the exact situation that happened. That's the thing that came out about it, and that's what I think. Right, that's very concrete and to the point. Then you have some other people that are just kind of amorphous and all over the place. All right, so that's one division, one dichotomy that he basically has, communication stuff. The other dichotomy that he has then is <clears throat> cooperative versus utilitarian, as he has it described here. Right? He viewed it as who are the people who are very cooperative, doing what is best for the community, doing what they think others want to be done, doing what the team, the group would value versus doing utilitarian what works. Now, in a way, this one can be a little bit tricky sometimes because in many cases, some people are going to do what the group wants because maybe that's just the practical thing to do. But there's going to be people who are instinctively focused on what is the thing that works? If it works, that's where my attention is going towards, not whether everyone likes it or whether it's the approved way to do things. This is what works, so that's what I'm going to use. And I don't want to do something that I feel may not work or may not work well just because it's the way it's supposed to be done or because that's the rules or because that's what other people say should be done. That's essentially how he's kind of breaking it down. Now you see this four quadrants, so you're looking at, are they abstract in their communication and they're still very cooperative, trying to do what is best for most people or what is good for people in general, not focused on whether things work, how it works, just whether it's good for people. Okay, well, if those two line up, then they are in this idealist group. If they're focused more on abstract ideas and concepts, but they are interested in how something works, why it works, let's use what works, regardless of how people feel or think about it, or whether that's the approved way of doing it, well, then you're rational. Over here, artisans, they're more concrete in their language, and they're focused on what works and how it works, why it works. And then finally, the guardians, concrete in their language, but focus more on what's good for people, what's been approved of, what do people like to do, what is going to be best for people in general. Okay, as you keep going, concrete language. Some people talk about primarily the external concrete world of everyday facts, figures, word, play, family, news, sports, weather, da -da 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 -da. right? Artisans and guardians talk. And in the abstract, People talking about ideas, theories, conjectures, dreams, philosophy, beliefs, fantasy, the ifs and what ifs and maybes. Right? These are the idealists and rational. So if you're coming out of a Jungian approach, you can kind of see how, how concrete people would sound like sensory. And abstract people sound like intuitive. Kind of simple. Simplistic, a bit, but effective. Action. So the cooperative, as we mentioned, people doing what is what is in keeping with agreed upon social rules, conventions, codes of conduct, following within the normal structure of things. And as a secondary, they're going to go with, hey, this is what works or could work best and how it works well. The utilitarians tend to focus more on, hey, what works? Right. This works and this can work best. What if other people don't like it? I don't care. I want to focus more on what works. So then here, he gets into the self-image. Again, kind of simplistic, but you kind of get the point there. The artisans, artistic action, audacity, adaptability. These are people that want to be very good at particular skills, and they value skills skills and getting good at those things that are useful okay? being lively and in the moment guardians reliability service respectability again this is very much about that cooperation um 
very family oriented, very group oriented, very following within conventional societal structures of things. Idealist, empathy, benevolence, authenticity. These are people who just in general, they're trying to do what is best for society and people from an emotional standpoint. And then the rationals, in, uh, ingenuity, autonomy, and willpower. So these guys are basically trying to do the thinkers. They're trying to figure out, hey, how can we think things through and do this and that and there, come up with better ways to do things. This essentially comes out to the SPs, the SJs, the NFs, and the NTs. Okay. Now, you will notice there are certain things in here that if you're coming across this from a socionics point of view, there's some stuff's going to like jump right out at you and drive you crazy. In socionics, we don't think of NTs as having a lot of willpower. That would be something we'd associate with SE, high SE. So this kind of goes away, what, right? Um, reliability, service, respectability, kind of sort of for SJs, but it leaves a lot to be desired, right? So we can see certain things in here, benevolence, not all NFs are necessarily benevolent. They think they are, though. They think what they're doing might be the right thing and best for everyone. But sometimes what they are doing to achieve the best thing for everyone can be some evil stuff. Take some ENFJ Hitler type who thought what he was doing was best for Germany and best for the world and so on, but he's killing a lot of people. All right, so little hand, hand, weak part. Okay, a good part. Temperament and intelligence. So Kiersey basically is lining up each of these temperaments with having a certain kind of intelligence, something that they tend to do particularly well, especially when allowed to develop. It. The SPs are better at tactics, being in the moment, figuring out what works here and now, how to win and achieve their goals here and now. This is great for business in the now, uh, battlefield tactics, the arts in general, performance arts, especially sports, things like that, things where you need to be capable of figuring out what's gonna work now, how can I win, how can I do stuff? Okay. What are the best tools to use in the here and now? If I'm a craftsman, if I'm somebody who, um, a tradesman, Something like that. What are the best tools and things I can really use now? Logistics, keeping track of day-to-day -day things, making sure everything is taken care of, making sure everything's been provided for, that the family has everything, being reliable and consistent with all those logistics. Um, very useful for SJs. Diplomacy, just being good kind of with people, understanding what makes people tick, what do they want, how can I work with people, how can I communicate with people, how can I get people to communicate with each other. This kind of more social skill, and especially long term as well, that's part of this. Being able to get people to work well together in the long run, so not just today, but fix whatever underlying issues people are having so that they are performing better emotionally, communicating better long term. Okay, this would be the NF. And then strategy would be your NTs, thinking about what's going to work particularly in the long term. So it works nicely if you're thinking about um, making investments, building businesses and developing those businesses over time. It's gonna take 10 years for your business to grow. It's gonna take five years for it to grow, 15 years, whatever. Um, or making prototypes, designing things, engineering things, creating models. And it's gonna take you a while. So models, in this case, or prototypes, could be as simple as you're creating your own typology system. You're focusing on, on socionic system, or you're focusing on types, whatever. And you want to build a model. That's going to take you a while. Okay? It's going to take you a long time. A long time to reap any kind of rewards or benefits from it. And you're going to be tweaking it and working on it and developing it and then promoting it, right? It takes a long time. 
right? That's usually going to be in the realm of an NP who's going to have the patience or just the flat out curious interest to keep tinkering with these mental models for years and years and years. So we notice some abstraction going on here in the diplomacy and strategy, as well as time, like very NI time based, developing things, seeing where it could go and where it's going to go, and then continuing to develop that. Over. Um, ben, I'm borrowing your word. That's from Ben Vasserlin and his channel. He likes to talk about NI as development of something over time. I rather like that. Personally, I think that's a nice term. So, Ben, that one's for you. Nice and I, whatever. Okay. Anyway, all right. And then he has the 16 types that we're all familiar with, right? The 16 MBTI types. Here you go. All the artisans, which are all these SPs, the guardians, the idealists, right? All these different things. Again, in my opinion, don't focus so much on the, the type like ESTP and ISTP. Try to just pay attention to the, the name that's there, like promoter, crafter, teacher. Focus more on that because when you start looking at those four letter types, you're going to say, wait a minute, this doesn't look like an ISTP to me. This ain't right. And then we're going to get into that socionic battle over the LSI, the TISI type should not be an artisan, but should actually be a guardian. And then the, uh, what is the SLI, shouldn't be a guard, it should be the artist. And, and it's just, it's pointless arguing back and forth. Just don't do it. Get rid of it. Forget about it. Ignore that part. Do yourself a favor. Right? Okay, and then we get into the whole story. All right, so that's how he does it. So. Back to where I started with this way of breaking things down. What do people talk about? How do they talk about it? Are they concrete? Are they abstract? Um, are they into utilitarian, how it works, why it works? Or are they more in the cooperative? This is a simple way of kind of breaking things down. It's not perfect if you're somebody who's really into Carl Jungian. Uh, cognitive process and you just love that stuff then you're probably going to hate here because you're going to say he's too much into the behavior stuff okay but the negative if you're so into all of that carl jungian stuff is you're going to have a hard time ever typing anybody you're going to be debating forever who has ni and who has this and who is using that and oh my god irritating this approach is a lot simpler. One of the downsides to Kiersey's approach, though, okay, this method can be misleading because there are plenty of people who, let's say, will speak in a concrete way. They've learned how. They work in fields where you need to, where you have to learn to do that. It's not tolerated to be in this abstract, weird thing. You have situations where you're working alongside someone and they're not necessarily opening up to you about their dreams and how they feel about Nietzsche and how they feel about existentialism. They may not be talking about that. It's not because they don't think about it or that they don't like it. They just realize that maybe now is not the time and the place to talk about it. So you end up getting the false impression that they're this concrete person. And it's like, maybe not. Maybe they actually are one of these in more intuitive abstract types that just have learned not to just start blabbing about their weird ideas all the time. Okay. So this kind of works well when you do run into certain kinds of people that are extremely abstract and the poor souls cannot seem to ever put anything in the concrete. Okay, that's where things can get kind of, you know, uh, that's where it becomes more obvious. And there are some people like that, unfortunately. You also, on the flip side, have some people that are super concrete. Oh, my God. And they never seem to be able to talk about more abstract ideas. They just go on and on about the supermarket and the discount and the 
grocery bills and oh my goodness, you know, and, and that they finally found something on sale. And like, that seems to be all they ever talk about. They can never seem to get into this area over here at all. There are just some people like that too. And then you're going to run into people who seem to straddle the line somewhere. There's somewhere in here in the middle where they do a pretty good job of abstract things that they're interested in and talk about, but they also do a lot of concrete things. And that's where things start getting messy. Okay. So anyway, that's the basic overview of this. Um, then we can start talking about each individual one of these. I'm going to make a separate video for that because I'm sure this is long already. Okay. So why bring it up? Just a basic summary overview. What are we talking about? Introduction on Kiersey temperament, his contribution to MBTI. I don't think I mentioned the beginning and by now, if anyone's still listening, uh, he talks about or his system, I should say, sorry. His system is the foundation for eventually Dr. Linda Behrens, another psychologist who studied under Kiersey, and she has her contribution to the system. She's the one who really comes up with um, interaction style is her main thing. And then one of her students is Dario Nardi. Dario Nardi studied under Linda Behrens, and so forth. So you're seeing this, this pedigree, this chain going on here, this lineage, actually, that's the word I'm searching for, a lineage of Kiersey to Linda Behrens to Dr. Dario Nardi. And we all know that all of these characters are huge within MBTI world, very influential people. They're actual doctors that actually work in psychology in some form which gives them a lot of credibility to what they're saying and doing. Certainly a lot more credibility than maybe a few other people who they're just random people, random people online, random people making stuff up, whatever. Doesn't mean those random people don't have good things to say, but it does help when you have a doctorate in psychology, work in the field, and you have access to resources and research material, patient upon patient upon patient and person upon person to gather data, gather statistics, okay, that's very helpful. So that lends a lot of credibility to this overall typing system uh, of Kiersey and Barons and Nardi. Okay. So this was the whole thing uh, for Kiersey. We talked about, of course, how this kind of stacks up against socionics, some of the pros and cons. This is a lot simpler more empiric in its observation. Socionics, a lot harder. Socionics, not always so obvious, not always so empiric. You can't just look at the person, see what they're talking about and doing and figure out exactly which quadra or exactly which um, cognitive elements are there and where they are. It's not always so simple. Not without at least doing some kind of an interview or really knowing them. So just the pros and cons. All right, so kind of the beginning of this. Uh, as always, like, subscribe, put your comments in. Have you heard of Kiersey? Do you like Kiersey? Do you can't stand Kiersey? Are you a so diehard socianist? Kiersey sucks, you know, whatever. Right. As always, I enjoy the dialogue. So on to the next thing.